Can I talk first this episode or do you want to talk first? I, I never realized that was an issue for you until last week. No, no, you go ahead. I'm going to make way for you. All right. That's uh, you how think, humble I am. You think there's a certain prestige with having the first word? I think people look forward to hearing one or the other of our voices and I just thought I'd give them a little bit of... Something different, you know? My wife and I have this game whenever we would watch episodes of The West Wing, we would predict which character was going to get the prestige of saying, previously, on The West Wing. Yeah. <laughs> like, who's it going to be? <laughs> I think it's going to be Leo. I think it's going to be Josh. Oh, it was CJ. Oh. <laughs> it was always a rare one when Charlie got a Guernsey, wasn't it? Charlie didn't get Yeah, he didn't get many. But- no, no, Leo didn't get many either. But there was always... Um, I wonder if there are people who press play on their unmade podcast and think is it going to be tim or is it going to be brady it's going to be brady isn't it (laughs) it's going to be brady oh it was tim it was tim oh wow tim we have another contribution in the uh growing canon of sofa shop covers being played on university bell towers in the united states Wow. <laughs> it's a niche genre. It's a niche genre. But <laughs> but a growing niche genre, yeah. that's for sure. So we've had uh, the University of Florida and we've had Yale. And now Rishab has written in with the following. Hi, Brady and Tim. On the 20th of April at 7.30 p.m., the sofa shop was performed from the top of the UT Tower at the University of Texas at Austin. Oh, there you go. Uh, Wow. I'm a graduate student at the University of Texas at Austin, and here is my contribution to Tim's vision of all the carillons across America chiming to the sofa shop. I requested the University of Texas Guild of Caroliners, Caroliners, to play the sofa shop from the UT Tower, and Jose was gracious enough to arrange and play it himself. Here's the video of the sofa shop jingle being played. Now, there are two videos, one from the outside and the other of Jose actually playing the carillon at the top of the tower. Now, this is special, Tim, because although we've had videos of all the previous renditions, we've never had it actually being played by the player on video. For people who don't know, carillons are these bell complexes up in the tower of multiple bells, and there's normally a little room up there with pedals and keyboards and stuff that it's played on, and we've actually got video from in the room this time. Oh, it's incredible. I know. Thrilling to see with, with, with Jose, that's his name, Jose. I think it's Jose. Sitting there at the levers. Mate, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. special. Secret footage, very exciting. Exclusive. Mm. First time on our podcast. Exclusive, that's, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rishab finishes his email by saying, according to Wikipedia, the UT Tower is the tallest university clock tower in the United States. At 307 feet, that's 94 metres, only two metres shorter than the Elizabeth Tower, where Big Ben is. It has 27 floors. It is also right across from the Texas State Capitol building. Thank you for making the wonderful podcast and for Tim's contagious laughter. Thanks, Rishab. This is feeling pretty special. The highest tower of all the university towers in America, across from the Texas capital. Why are they building these towers everywhere? There seems to... I wonder if there was a real movement of them at one stage, if they're all of a similar vintage. Yeah, I mean... And, um, suddenly they popped up everywhere. It's pretty obvious what's going on here, isn't it? Like, there's a, <laughs> You know what's going on. <laughs> it's a bit of a contest. Yes, I think so. My tower's bigger than your tower. That's right, that's right, that's right. Yes, yes. <laughs> I wonder if there'll be, a uh, amongst some of the newer colleges, a real movement of having these erected around the country as well. <laughs> erected, you, know, they could, you say? We could build a library. 
<laughs> or, or we could build a Carolyn Tower. Maybe that's the next thing we need to do. Maybe we, the Unmade Podcast needs to be the first podcast that has its own bell tower. Oh, we could broadcast from there. Oh, oh that's a great amazing. idea. Amazing. Imagine that, broadcasting from a mighty tower. Where would we build it? All right. Halifax Street? Halifax Street. I think that's probably the only place on, on Halifax Street. Yeah. <laughs> and then if we moved, we'd just re-edit the song. Yeah. Again. <laughs> knowing, knowing our luck, Berkowitz would end up buying our tower. That's right. <laughs> Bloody Berkowitz. The Ber- the, and it'll be known for 100 years as the Berkowitz Tower. And no one will know why. I'm thinking Berkowitz was some great pioneer, but no, no. Anyway, thank you very much, Rishab, for organising that. And thank you, Jose, or Jose, but I'm going with Jose, but it could be Jose. I know both pronunciations can be used for playing it. And it was lovely to see the video. Obviously, if you're watching the YouTube version, you just saw the video. And I'll also link to the video in the notes so you can all go and have a look. It's well worth it. Well worth it. It's it's kind of, it reminds me a bit of that guy running the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, you know, with all the levers. And stuff. <laughs> I know. He looks a bit like that, doesn't he? <laughs> he does, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's kind of a bit awkward and clunky and yeah. Yeah, yeah. You don't often get like close up footage of, you know, like piano hands playing on the cover of an album. You don't often get that in this case, do you? Yeah. It's, it's sort of bashing levers and you sort of play it in the way that like a little toddler plays a piano when they yeah. s- sit up on the piano stool and they yeah. go bang, 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 bang. Because yeah, they're, they're, like, they're probably pretty hefty. Yeah, you really give them a big whack. No offense, Jose. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the actual sound. We're talking about the design of the thing, but the actual sound was beautiful. Having a carol on seems like something like Muse or U2 would do at one of their big stadium shows, like wheel on some carol on tower and have someone play it just for one song. It's not the kind of instrument that your parents surprise you with for your birthday. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Give it a go. We've, we've organised five lessons yeah. and we've erected this in the backyard. Yeah. yeah, there's a little surprise out the back for you. Look what, look what Dad's built. <laughs> you might be wondering what all the workmen have been doing there for the last six months. I'm going to make it my, my next ambition to play a carillon. I want to play one. If anyone can get me access to one, I want to get inside and play one. Help me out, people. Preferably in the UK at the moment. Are you going to learn? No, no. Learn how- I, just want to, I just want to bash the keys. Yeah, I just want to have. Oh, right. Okay. I just want to jam. <laughs> so you, know, I'm going to record it, and it's going to be your version of of Money for Nothing, yeah. where it's just. Yeah, yeah I don't yes. want to actually learn to play the carillon properly. I just want to hit, just just muck around with it and bash on it, a bit like your guitar playing, basically. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you just want to wear it around your neck and carry it around to look cool. Yeah. <laughs> That it's 94 metres high. Yeah. Or like wheel a 300 foot high tower into Rundle Mall and do some busking. <laughs> I wonder what they did in the 80s, whether there was like a movement to have like electronic carolers. You know what I mean? Like neon pink and stuff with, you know, yeah. <laughs> just hotting them up yeah. with, with neon signs and stuff, making them all electronic. And or playing cool. like an awesome gig and then setting fire to the tower at the end, like for a big spectacular <laughs> end. <laughs> That's a, that's a, just Jimi Hendrix style. Jimi Hendrix. It's like, well, there goes $2.2 million. Yeah. Let's build, build another one. Nice. <laughs> or build two towers next to each other and have dueling carolins. <laughs> that's right, right next to each other. Oh, dear. All right. No idea. Ideas for a podcast. Who's going first this week with an idea? Oh, we're on to this already. I think it's my turn to go first. I think it probably is, yeah. seeing it's come up this quick. Actually, I do. Yeah, there, there we go. Yeah, there's my idea. I'm happy to go first, but no, no, if you want to go first now. Well, you went first last episode. I know, and it was a roaring success. <laughs> no, no. Once again, I defer to you, Brady. You go ahead. <laughs> don't, don't give me that. <laughs> I'm humble. <laughs> go ahead. Humble? You were texting me before saying your idea is an absolute cracker. <laughs> I must remember what that one was. Yeah. <laughs> no, go, you go ahead. Go ahead. My idea comes from uh, some research I stumbled over this week that was in the media. People were talking about it. There was some polling done by a company called YouGov, 
and they surveyed, oh, I think, like a thousand odd Americans. And at first, they asked them a bunch of questions about who would win a fight between two animals. And they did all these different configurations, you know, who would win a fight between a wolf and a gorilla. And they, get, and they did all the combinations to find out which was the, you know, the best animal, which animal would win the most fights. But then what they did was they asked all the people they surveyed if they thought they would beat that animal in a fight, if they had to fight that animal unarmed, who would win the fight? Right. You know, if you were fighting against an elephant unarmed, who do you think would win the fight? And they published all the results. So before we go into my podcast idea, I'm just curious, Tim, who you think would win a fight between you unarmed and some of these animals. Can I just say, this? did you say this was from YouGov? Yeah. Like, I, it, this wasn't some, like, brekkie show. This no, was... it was YouGov. <laughs> I think it was a bit of a publicity stunt. Right. Uh, well, obviously, they're getting a lot of publicity. They've made mm. it all the way onto the Unmade podcast, so, you know, it's worked. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope they, they've got another strategy, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it did also show some interesting differences between age groups. But in particular, it showed some interesting differences between men and women because uh, men fancy their yeah. chances a lot more than women against a lot of these animals. Uh, all right, all yeah. right. <laughs> let, me, let me go through the animals they listed and let me see if you think, who you think would win a fight between you and this animal. And don't be shy about telling me how you think the fight would unfold as well, you know, for a bit of colour. So, and this is just me standing there, the animals in front of me, how would I go? That's, Who would win the, the fight? Way. No guns, no knives. No right. guns or knives. No spoons. Just uh, no chair with a whip. No, no, none of that. The thing is, and this is the difficult thing. I'll I'll outline the problem before we even start. They don't define what winning the fight means. Mm. And you know, you could take this different ways. But anyway, who would win the fight between an unarmed Tim? Let's start with a rat. A rat. Yeah. Well. Let's presume for the moment the rat can't just run away. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's escaped and therefore won. I don't, say... I don't think you've won the fight if you just run away. You haven't, no, you've not, no, you've not won not. a fight there. I could kill a rat. I've killed a rat. Well, not with my bare hands, I guess, with a trap. But no, I no, think I unarmed. would win a fight No a traps here. Unarmed. Unarmed. No, no, no. I'm willing to back myself against a rat. All right. As, as did most other people, 68% of women and 76% of men. That means 32% of women in America think a rat would beat them in a fight. And 24% of men. Hmm. Maybe, they, yeah, that's, maybe they think they just wouldn't want to. You know what I mean? Like they'd, oh, no, I wouldn't want to touch it. I wouldn't win. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they've responded that way. But like if your life um, depended on it or something. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Okay. How do you think the fight would unfold, Tim? How would you like fight the rat? Well, the rat would chase me for about 10 minutes and then I'd finally have to turn around. And step on it. <laughs> and step on it, yeah. Um, in my mind initially, I was sort of picking it up and squeezing it, you know, like mm. that sort of thing, or mm. just shaking it back and forth. Like, <laughs> do you submit? Do you submit? <laughs> I can't talk for God's sake, I'm a rat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. All right, next animal. Yes. A house cat. A house cat. Yeah. Well, see, this brings you to a. It's very distasteful. Like, it, I don't. Yeah. I wouldn't want to. I know you don't want to. I'm not saying, Tim, do you want to kill a house cat? That's not the question. <laughs> the question is, if you had to fight a house cat unarmed, who do you think would win the fight? I, I know you're certainly not asking the question. If given the chance, would a cat want to kill us? Because we all know, we all, we all suspect, yeah, and and probably know that they do. Yeah, cats. <laughs> Generally scheming most of the time. Look, could I beat a cat? I could. I'd get scratched though. I think that's what I've learnt from yeah. from uh, many a cartoon that that this kind of situation would mean I got quite scratched, but I would prevail. I have a recurring dream that a cat is biting my hand and won't let go no matter what I do. I think it must be something to do with an angle I sleep on that causes pain in my hand, which then makes me dream pain in my hand. And the dream I use is a cat biting my hand and I cannot make it let go, which obviously, you know, in my sleep, the hand is hurting and I can't stop the pain. Oh, wow. It's a really common dream for me, having a cat just clamp onto my hand and not let go. Why, why is it a cat biting you? Sometimes it's a dog, but it's usually a cat. I don't know. All right, here we go, Tim. Mm. 
Tim Hine versus a goose. <laughs> <laughs> I would beat a goose, yes. You'd beat a goose? I, a, lot of, I, a lot of people thought the goose would win. Go- I think a goose could be a surprisingly good fighter. Well, they, they do that sort of... The, firstly, they're loud, so mm. you'd be, you know, they'd be more intimidating, and then they do that jabbing motion with their head mm. while they're loud, you know, squawking at you. But I reckon a goose would be easier to kill than a cat. Oh, I don't agree with that. I don't agree. I think their neck is a big vulnerability. I don't like talking about this. This is not... <laughs> You, it doesn't have to be kill. It just has to be win in a fight. They don't. Def- obviously, your mind immediately goes to killing because that seems like the only way to truly win a fight. But they don't say that any anyone has to die here. They just say the fight has to be won. No. Yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah. yeah. Because one of my daughters has stopped listening already. That's for sure. Just for the record, people, because <laughs> it's obviously concerning Tim. We are not suggesting Tim wants to kill any animal. No. Except emus, because everyone hates emus. <laughs> <laughs> Emus are scary. Emus, I hate emus. <laughs> I don't want to kill an emu, but I hate them. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to skip medium-sized dog because I think that will freak you out too much. What about mm. an eagle? I think the eagle might win. Yeah. Gosh. Not only have they got those badass beaks, but they've also got huge talons you know, on their claws. Yes. And they can go up and down and up and down on top of you. And you, all you're doing is standing there on the ground, waving around, trying to True. wrestle. They, they've got flight as well, yeah. Truly fearsome. Yeah. Like, I, I, I think I'd yield to You'd yield eagle. to... What about a mm. king cobra? <laughs> <laughs> well... They've only got one real strategy, but it's a pretty effective. It's a one. good one. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah, <laughs> and look, they can try and try again. I I can't miss once. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, I no, I'd yield. Yes, kangaroo. Oh well, yes. I mean, they're notoriously good boxers. You got no good. chance. You got no chance against a kangaroo with those that those huge kicking feet. I would try and befriend it. Mm. Uh, tickle it <laughs> Tickle it, befriend it, Come trick on. it Gain its trust and then whack it in the back of the head <laughs> <laughs> You'd outthink it I, I, I challenge you to a game of chess You know I have a recurring dream That I'm being tickled by a kangaroo <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you'd have any chance against a crocodile? No, no. none whatsoever The thing with a no. crocodile too is like even if the crocodile was having one of those lazy days where it decided it wasn't going to bite you in half, hmm. I still don't know what I could do to a crocodile just laying there. That would they, they they're so well armored. Like hmm. I just don't think I think if a, cro- a crocodile would sleep through my fight and still win. Yeah, they are. Well, they're like dinosaurs, aren't they? In that set, like they just it seem to be impenetrable. But I tell you, the I'm thinking about Crocodile Dundee, the movie, and Mick Dundee seems to come in with a knife through the head. Yeah. So I, I guess that's the only thing I'd know what... Yeah, but you're not allowed to have weapons. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. Well, there are lots of other animals on here. They have elephant, right? And mm. 9% of men and 8% of women said that they would beat an elephant in a fight. How could you <laughs> beat an elephant in a fight? <laughs> what do you... That's another one where you just... Yeah. Even if you go your hardest and the elephant just stands there, it's, it's, they're largely going to be indifferent to your attack. Yeah, I mean, that's, it. that's exactly it. The elephant could win the fight and not know the fight happened. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, I'd yield There's a li- There's a lion mm. on here, of course. Uh, what chance have you got against a lion? It'd be interesting to, to, to work out combinations of who you join forces with against certain animals. Oh, like, yeah. Like, I reckon... Like phone a friend. Yeah, that's right. Like me and the lion and the eagle, we we could take the goose pretty quickly, you know. Like <laughs> me and the lion and the eagle, <laughs> it's like the ultimate yeah. like, trio. <laughs> I'd watch that show. Tim, a lion, and the eagle just wandering Australia, picking fights with other animals. <laughs> <laughs> and you could like tag in different animals and have different combinations, oh, you know. Like with Tim, <laughs> you see, we haven't even really discussed the podcast idea, and I think you've hit on a brilliant one there. <laughs> So there are lots of other animals on this list. I'll link to the polling. I was thinking of a few other animals that weren't on the list. What about a wombat? A wombat. That would be an interesting fight because they're like, they're tough. They're hardy, but I don't see how what threat they pose to you, how they would attack you. No. Yeah. A bit of a stalemate, I think, a fight with a wombat. 
People know this. I mean, notoriously, you can hit them with a car, and it, accidentally, if you do, in the and you'll get a massive dent. They'll often survive, and you'll get a massive oh, yeah. dent at the front I'll of the flip car. Flip your car over if you um, hit a wombat. But they're they're awesome. <laughs> they're, <Yeah. like> <laughs> they're brilliant. Oh, I think the key you. to fighting an animal for us would be: is there a chance that you could blind it before it deals its killer blow? Could you poke it in the eyes and blind it? Because an, another animal isn't going to think to blind us. They're just going to try and bite you or, ju- you know, bite your jugular or, you know, do whatever they do. But we, if you can blind it, if you can poke it in the eyes in that first skirmish or do something to startle it and disable it in that first skirmish, then you could gain the upper hand. And that's probably when you think about a shark or something, your only mm. real option apart from getting out of there as quick as you can. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. My podcast idea is getting people on talking about fighting against animals, which I think we have already shown <laughs> is fertile ground for a podcast chat. <laughs> I just thought you were stalling because of your idea. <laughs> you, you didn't want to get to it. I think good. you've taken the idea to another level, though, where you can like put together like your Avengers team. Like I say, you have to fight that grizzly bear, gorilla and chimpanzee. You know, what two animals do you mm. want to join you in the fight? Like, I love the idea of assembling these dream teams <laughs> and then talking about how the fight unfolds. Building alliances. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you can have, like, one from category A. Oh, you yeah. You know what I mean? Like, one bird, one reptile, and you can have them all categorised. Or you, or you assign mm. a, a certain number of points to each animal, like in sort of fantasy uh, sports leagues, and you you can use thirty points worth of power. So I'll take the lion, which is fifteen points, and the wolf, which is ten points, and I'll chuck in a house cat mm. with five points, you know, to get my thirty points. Yeah, mm. yeah. Just building on your point that this is not about killing necessarily. Necessarily. Well, beating. It said beat. Yeah, said beating. it just said who and would who think... would win the fight. Yeah, there's no definition as to what winning the fight means. Well, it could be like Karate Kid and you've got to get three points, you know, touching their chest or something. I think we've all learned from childhood, winning the fight means you get the other person on their back on the ground and you're on top of them holding their arms down and being able to tap on their chest like a typewriter. <laughs> that annoying ticklish <laughs> way. <laughs> Right. I'd love to see. I'd love to see you doing that to a king cobra. <laughs> There's a lot of chest there. It's very thin, yeah. but very hard to get the elbows down. It'd be humiliating if a cobra beat you in a fight like that. It never once bit you, but it managed to pin you down and typewriter your chest. <laughs> <laughs> the image I've got is from the Wonder Years, you know, of Wayne yeah. attacking Kevin like that, you know, oh, yeah. and that sort of older brother sort of tussle that goes on. Oh, I've inflicted many of those. Except instead of the typewriter, you do the dangling spit. Oh, Brady. (laughs) Come on. Come on. Oh, dear. I'm an only child, so I I just sort of just sort of rolled around on the ground with myself. (laughs) (laughs) Doing that. Come on, Gabby, you. (laughs) Maybe that's why I fancy my chances so much against the animal kingdom, because I've never been truly tested against a sibling. No, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I think my, my sister listened to that list and went, that's nothing. I had Brady for 10 years. <laughs> I, yeah. can, I can take anything. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. All right, sponsor time. Story blocks. Story blocks. Well, wow. Do you know what? When I tell you about story blocks, Tim, yeah. this is what I think of. Speaking of animals and lions, you know how story blocks is a library an online library of video, audio, images that you can use royalty-free in your creations. Is it? Stock footage. It is. It is. Right. And there's so much great stuff in there that you can use, all for just one monthly fee. And when I tell you about it, Tim, I like to think of you and I as Mufasa and Simba going to the top of a mountain (laughs) and me saying to you, Tim, see all that footage out there, all that video, all that audio, all those images, everything the light touches is yours to use (laughs) if you subscribe to Storyblocks. (laughs) Everything? So now we're... (laughs) Is it a promotion or a demotion that I've gone from being your wingman to being your son? Like it's a- <laughs> You're the future king. So go to storyblocks.com slash unmade and, uh, and check it out. Use the slash unmade so they know you came from here 
And if you like what you're seeing and you're thinking, you know, I, I make videos, I make podcasts, I, I create things, I need material that I can't necessarily go out and travel the world and film myself, mm. and I certainly can't film it at that quality, use the Storyblocks library. That's what it's there for. You can use as much as you want. It is like being the king of Pride Rock. In, in The Lion King, right, are you convinced by Mufasa's explanation Remember Simba says, but don't we eat antelope? And then he says, yes, but when we die, we become the grass and antelope eat the grass. And that feels like one of those cop-out dad explanations, doesn't it? Like, <laughs> that he's just sort of going. <laughs> but don't we eat the antelopes? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just feel like that's one of those, uh, like he goes, oh, and I'm like, uh, that's not quite. It's not quite that simple, is no, it? No, like, yeah, I'd still rather be a lion than an antelope in that whole story. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I'm just having a look at some of the video footage that Storyblocks has of lions, and it's fantastic. So if you're watching the YouTube version of the podcast, you'll be seeing all those lions on screen at the moment. Go and have a look at the lion footage on Storyblocks, people. It's fantastic. Storyblocks.com/unmade. We appreciate their support and you will appreciate all their great material. Is it time for Spoon of the Week? Tell me it is. It is. Yep. Spoon Should of I, the week. Can I play it? Can oh. I can I hit it? Can I press the button? Go. Spoon of the week. Now Tim. Yes. We have been soliciting spoon donations, people to send in their own spoons for us to feature on Spoon of the Week. And I know this has been a little bit of a sore point with you. Mm. You're a bit you're a bit protective, mm. a little bit jealous of your Spoon of the Week section, because normally we feature spoons from the Hein family collection. But we need to share the love. And we've been getting so many spoons sent in now. I'm actually building up I've actually had to buy a box to store them all in. So I need to burn through some spoons that are being sent in. And we've had some spoons sent in in particular that really, really rate a mention today. Oh, yeah. Is that okay? Can we can we put the hind spoons aside for for this week? I mean, are these are just this is just this this is just sort of spin-off additional sort of stuff. This is not part of the main collection, and I'm perfectly comfortable. But I like to think of it as like a classic library art mm. or a classic museum that started off with one collection, you know. Hundreds of years ago, which is the which is your spoons, the Heinz spoons, but then as the museum has become more and more popular and internationally renowned, benefactors have wanted to contribute their collections to it, so it's got its own sub collections and different wings and holes and things like that. So no one will ever forget the importance of the original collection. And occasionally you will go to the Louvre and they'll say, "Do you know what this painting was in the original Louvre collection?" But still, you can go to a wing of all new stuff that has just been recently donated. That's how things are expanding. I think of it more like it—it's the Rogue One from the Star Wars, you know, series. It's just—it's ah. an offshoot. It's an extra special edition. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, they're just rogue spoons. But anyway, well, you know, no, well, but you could earn your right to be recognised. But well, um, let me tell you, I think Ellen from Helsinki in Finland has definitely earned that right, and let me tell you why. I received a package from Ellen this week, and it came with a letter. Let me read you the letter. Dear Brady and Tim, these are my great aunt's collection of souvenir spoons that I thought might bring you and fellow civilians more joy than they do for me right now, hidden in a storage box forever. As you see, she was quite well travelled. She was a very active person in the Finnish skiing scene. These are all, as I understand, mainly collected in the 1970s and 80s. Enjoy from Ellen. And Ellen has sent in a magnificent collection of 46 spoons collected by her great aunt, who I I don't know, but I got the impression she's passed away. I hope she didn't just not walk into her great aunt's house and take all the spoons. Right, yes. <laughs> so Ellen's great aunt collected all these spoons over her lifetime. And rather than having them stored in a box forever, Ellen has entrusted them to us, to the Unmade podcast. Well, it's, it's quite a gift if they're of any sort of real quality. Let's have a look at them. 
<laughs> I've I've chosen four for today. Right. And I'll, so I'll fly through them. I won't go through them at Tim pace because four spoons at Tim pace would make this a very long podcast. All right. The first one I've chosen is a very small and dainty spoon, more simple one. And the logo at the top is of a enameled bird with its wings spread and the word Tyrol, as in the Tyrol region. Presumably, I'm thinking of Austria, and the reason I chose that is because my brother-in-law is from the Tyrol region of Austria, and almost all the skiing I have ever done has been in the Tyrol mountains. So when I think of skiing, I think of the Tyrol. And because this collection comes from a very famous skier, I thought I would choose this Tyrol spoon as the first one to feature. Well, let's have a look. Well, my, my, well they are beautiful. Uh, the Tyrol one first. Let's get to the... All oh, right, yeah, no, I'm just, uh, yeah, no, fair cop. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was going to say, it's no rosebud, but hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the Tyrol spoon. Quite simple. Tyrol, but... that's nice, dignified, but yep. medieval. Yep. Got a lovely, nice, ye olde, yep. um, European sort of look and feel to it. Lovely work. Mm. And then I've chosen three more spoons, and these are all matching. They're all kind of oh, yeah. the same design and shape, and I imagine they've they come from the same factory. One of them is from Budapest, in the capital of Hungary, and the other two are from Moscow. So they've got Moskva written on the top. It looks like Mokba, but I think that's in Cyrillic, which is Moskva. Right. Two Moscow spoons and a Budapest spoon, and they're all the same. Look, I'll start with the Budapest one. Golden spoon, very ornate bowl and stem. Quite a nice simple shield at the top with an enamel flower. Looks like a pink rose. But the bowl is the real highlight because it has a the bowl is also enameled with a picture of the river, which I think is the Danube going through uh, Budapest. And there's a bridge which my research has indicated is probably a bridge called the Liberty Bridge. Right. Crossing the Danube. Just a good-looking spoon. Nice spoon. And then the two Moscow spoons are exactly the same design. They're gold. They're ornate. They have the same handle, which is the shield, with a statue in it. It's a statue of a man on a horse. Mm. I believe from a bit of Googling that might be a statue of Yuri or Yuri of Dogloriki or something, who was a... It's to do, oh, with, the, yes, it's to do yes. with the founding of Moscow in 1147. This person was the founder of Moscow. So that's the top. But again, both of the bowls have beautiful enameled pieces of art. One of them very obviously is Red Square with uh, St. Basil's, the Basilica, and a Tower of the Kremlin. And the other one I didn't recognise. I haven't. I have been to Moscow, but I have not been to this bell. It's a famous bell in Moscow, which I think is called the Tsar Bell. It's the biggest bell in the world, and it's broken. It's never been rung. It's, it, it broke. It cracked in a fire before it ever even got rung. The Tsar Bell, or Royal Bell. I have to say, I say, given that they're not part of the, the, the you know, the original collection. They're beautiful. They're really stunning, aren't they? They're gorgeous, the, gorgeous um, spoons. And there are many, many more gorgeous spoons in what for now will be referred to as Ellen's Great Aunt Collection, which is a sub, <laughs> which is a subset of the Spoon of the Week collection. Well titled. I don't yes. know the aunt. I don't know. She didn't tell me what her great aunt's name is. I, have, I am trying to get in touch with her, but I haven't struggled so far. I've been doing all sorts of research to find out where Ellen is and who she is. Ellen, if you're listening... Tell us your great aunt's name so we can give her proper credit. But uh, for now... Name the collection. She might not want to because she probably likes it being called the Ellen Collection. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty more spoons where they came from. And lots of other spoons are coming in from civilians and stakeholders. I'm collecting them all together. I will start featuring them when possible. I have got them. And there'll be a link in the show notes to tell you what to do if you would like to send in more spoons. Nice work, man. You handled that well, Tim, losing a bit of control of Spoon of the Week today. Yeah, well, I just sort of had to bite my tongue and let you sort of go on. But I tell you that, you know, that you had, you cheated a bit by having four spoons. I mean, that's a bit overwhelming, but they are staggeringly beautiful. So you get away with it. I will be sending them your way, Tim, because spoons that have been featured on Spoon of the Week have to be part of the main collection, which unbelievably I'm trusting you with. I can't believe I'm doing it. They're very safe. They're very safe. I want them all to be together. It's the thing that gets me right. All, all the people that have been sending in these spoons, 
Like even if they're sending in a single spoon, they're wrapping them with layer upon layer upon layer of bubble wrap as if it's like, you know, the most valuable piece of crystal in the world. And every time I see your collection of spoons, they're just all rustling up against each other in a container and banging into each other. And <laughs> I just feel like, I don't know. I just don't feel like you're careful with stuff. I, I am careful. It's in a nice Tupperware container. Yeah, but they're all rattling around. And you go, oh, what's today's spoon going to be? And I can even hear it meow, as you bang them into each other as you pull one out. And I'm like, Tim, you need to look after these. They need to be well, on. That's the on natural a... environment, though. That's how they've been for years in a container. And like a, it's, uh, it's certainly after they're chosen and they've been featured on Spoon of the Week. They, they, they're put into a separate little plastic clear bag and, and, and they're taken care of. Um, hmm. Not convinced. They've been, they've been enthroned. So. <laughs> they've been chosen. Um, All right. Coined to... uh, now, winners, obviously, Spoon of the Week means it's time to have one winner of an unmade podcast souvenir spoon and ten winners of a, of a handful of Spoon of the Week collector cards, which are becoming the new sensation on the internet. These winners are chosen from our stakeholders, also known as our Patreon supporters. Tim, how are we going to choose today's winners? Shall we ring the Saar bell? The Saar bell, which is never being rung, should for the first time ever, <laughs> should we ring the Saar bell wow. to choose the I winners? Think that's a brilliant idea. Yeah? All right. <laughs> yes, go for it. Ring, ring the bell. Let me get out my giant bell ringing device and mm-hmm. whack the Saar bell as Tim reads aloud the name of our, first of all, our spoon winner. Who's going to get the souvenir spoon? Nicole S. from Ontario, Canada. Congratulations. Nice. Yes. All right. Congratulations, Nicole. And now here are ten more rings of the bell as Tim reads aloud the name of the card winners this week. Well, congratulations to Jonathan A. from Victoria in Australia. Ken H. from Minnesota. Malika or Malika from Quebec in Canada. Vikram from uh, or Vikram from Quebec in Canada. Hillary from Cambridge in the UK. Craig W. from Illinois. Diego C. from Florida. Joshua R. from Michigan. James B. from Tennessee. That's fun to say. And <laughs> Axel uh, from, from Denmark. Congratulations. All right. Cards coming your way. Oh, and a spoon coming your way. Nice to finally hear that bell get rung after all these years as well. Kremlin security were very understanding. <laughs> <laughs> I think they could see what we, where we were from. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Idea for a podcast. Before I get onto my idea, can I just say how comfortable my new office chair is? I've got a new office chair hmm. and it swivels without making any noise and it leans forward so that it supports my back. And I just have to say, um, it's oh, I don't know if you can notice it in my performance tonight, my, my tone or my voice or anything like that. Have the makers of this chair sponsored today's episode? No, not at all. No, I'm not. Well, then, no, you can't mention the chair. No. Well, okay, well, <laughs> I'll just move on. I'll just tell people. People are wondering, says, Tim sounds good today. I wonder what's going on. I'm telling you, my posture is better and I'm sitting here comfortably and there's no squeaking in the... I'm not sure it's good for you to be too relaxed, though. I think you need to be more on edge to be at your best. I don't want you getting all sleepy oh. and dozy as you're doing the podcast. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not falling asleep. It, it keeps me in The good posture keeps me up. I can't slump in it. Okay. So, all right. I'm awake. I'm here. All right. I'm here. Well, I'll, I'll decide that after I hear how good your podcast idea is. All right. All right. All right. Here we go. Right. So, let me, let, me, let me prove it to you then. Here we go. So, I, mine probably has the longest name for an idea that we've ever had. Right. I have no doubt that within five seconds of me telling it to you, you'll pop out some sort of perfect name that's far shorter. But I'm going to go with the name because the name does the wonderful job of explaining precisely what it is. Yep. My podcast is called Something My Kids Have Expressed a Minor Interest in That Justifies Me Finally Buying the Cool Version of That Thing I Desperately Wanted when I was a kid. <laughs> so what's this podcast about, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> F- 
furnish me with an example that will help me better understand. Well, one of my daughters recently at a friend's house skateboarded for the first time. Yeah. Now, I've had little or no interest in skateboarding since I was about, I don't know, 17. Hmm. I was never very good at it. Hmm. But when I was really young, I loved it, really loved it. And really would like, you know, there's a whole bunch of great skateboards. You buy skateboard magazines and you just see, you know, heroes like Tony Hawk and whatnot. And you just want a particular board. And you can never have them because, I don't know, when you're a kid, you don't get what you want. Or we certainly did. We couldn't (laughs) afford it. Or mum and dad just didn't understand it. And Santa never really delivered the way he should have. Um, (laughs) Tim, you you, you tell so many stories about like your deprived poor childhood. I'm going to, I need to find a jingle to play. (laughs) Hang on, let me start playing it now. Tell me how you didn't get the skateboard you wanted as a kid. Well, I asked for it again and again. I wanted a proper, proper skateboard. And then I ended up, apparently I had to buy it myself with money saved up. So I finally found a pretty crappy thin kind of skateboard at a garage sale. So I bought that. And that was pretty crappy and I was, you know, pretty embarrassed to sort of do anything with it yeah. in front of anyone. Um, but then finally I saved up and I bought a Pro 90, which is sort of a half decent skateboard, but nowhere near, like, you know, nothing that would feature yeah. in a decent magazine. Yeah. I had that problem. Well, my, the, the skateboard my parents bought me when I was a kid, when I went through the same phase, was like some, you know, home brand that you'd get at Bunnings or something. And all my friends had all the proper oh, no. cool ones. And I was really embarrassed. Like, you know, they would laugh at mine. It was like mine was made of pine or something and it had some stupid <laughs> name on it. I think it just had Hawaii written on it because Hawaii was exotic and cool. <laughs> like, it was like... <laughs> It was like your mum knitted you a skateboard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but the funny thing was, because we were young, right, Hawaii was written in all capitals. So imagine the word Hawaii written in all capitals. So the two I's at the end are just straight lines without dots on top. So they look a bit like L's. And because we were kids and we didn't know that Hawaii had this exotic spelling, one day the kids said, what brand of skateboard has Brady even got? And they tried to read the name and they thought it said Harwal, H-A-W-A-L-L. Harwall. So it was Brady and his Harwall skateboard <laughs> instead of Hawaii, which was even more embarrassing. So yeah. <laughs> I can't see the word Hawaii now without thinking of my Harwall skateboard. <laughs> so you didn't come up with some sort of young kid lice, you know, where you sort of say, oh, yeah, like Ben Harwell is this really amazing skater that, you know, no one's ever heard of because he's so underground. And you know what I mean? How you sort of come up with those sort of white lies and stuff when you're a kid to cover your shame. I wasn't that clever back then. I'm not that clever now, to be honest. But anyway, enough about my har wall. (laughs) Um, So anyway, your, 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 your daughter went skateboarding and this is like, this is triggered. And now you are a man of more means as an adult. You're thinking you can wish fulfill all your skateboard desires now. Well, I've just found myself going through through eBay, perusing <laughs> skateboards <laughs> late into the evening, just going, well, oh, I don't know about that one. I don't know about this one. <laughs> the, the irony thing is that these vintage 80s skateboard decks, right, because obviously if I bought her one, I'd buy the one that I always wanted, not the one that she might like now. Right. It, <laughs> They're ridiculously expensive. Like, they're still too expensive because they're all collector's <laughs> items. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not paying that. That's ridiculous. So this isn't a case of you thinking, now that my daughter's into skateboarding, I'm going to buy her one and buy myself one so I can skateboard alongside her and you're going to buy some $2,000, like, super exotic one. You're, th- this is you just buying one for her. Well, I think, I think well, yeah, it's, at the very least, it's me going, okay, well, I assume she has no idea what the best one would be to buy, hmm. so I would just buy... Get her a hard wall. It was <laughs> the best one in 1988, and, uh, <laughs> and I assume she'll be thrilled. Yeah. Um, but, look, look. I dare not stand on it. I'll kill myself. It's just I just thought it looked cool on the wall, but she can learn to ride on it, you know, like yeah. it'd be really cool. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. Like I'm looking here, there's this awesome, awesome one of the there's there's a couple of boards I would really love. There's this Tony Hawk Series 8 claw, right? It's like this pink one with a bird on it with the, the hawk on it, Pal Peralta. It's 749 pounds get oh. it, to get it imported in. Oh, that like is that's ex- ridiculous. Yeah, that is expensive. For a skateboard. Yeah. So just as my 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 means are better, I can't afford to buy a skateboard now. Now that I'm 45 years of age, <laughs> I um, 
I still, I'm now balking at it like my dad did, going, we're not paying that for a bit of pie, yeah. ply, you know, like it's, it's yeah. just ridiculous. Have there been other things that you have bought unnecessarily, like vicariously f- for your daughters in quote marks? <laughs> N- not really. I did think about getting like an old Atari, like video games. Like 2600, yeah. Like with Space Invaders and yeah. that kind of stuff. Then I moved on to thinking about getting a an NBA Jam, like arcade game yeah. in the apartment, which <laughs> which would be awesome. The originals are very hard to get, but I think there is like a replica one around the place that would be really cool. But again, I have no genuine idea that they actually want to play, you know, a game from 1992 yeah. for hours on end, like like we did at 16th birthday parties and stuff. So yeah. Um, do you, have you done any wish fulfillment this way? Like, have you have you gone, oh, finally I'm going to get one of those? Well, I mean, I don't have children, so I can't, like, cheat like you do. Um, no, no. But... You would have to own, I just want this now. Yeah, I mean, I have done that. I think I've talked about before, when I was young, I tried to collect the Return of the Jedi collector cards, and I fell about 30 or 40 cards short. I couldn't trade my way to them, and I, couldn't, I didn't have the money to just keep buying packs, hoping for random luck. So I, uh, yeah, I never got yeah. the full set. So, you know, when I was old enough, now I just went straight onto eBay and just bought a complete set, like already collected, yeah. you know, vintage, <laughs> like didn't even think twice about it. In fact, I think I've done it twice. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so I do do that. I do sometimes just buy some nostalgic thing on eBay cause, just because I can. Mm, but mm. yeah, I mean, I get it. I get it. I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that there shouldn't be things girls are into and things boys are into. But it just kind of seems inevitable that it does kind of happen still. There is just, this is just the society we live in. There are certain things that boys lean more towards and girls lean more towards. So let's just work in that framework for a minute. Yeah. In that way, are you deprived in any way by the fact you have two girls and no boys? I mean, I know you love your girls to pieces, but does having girls and no boys, has that deprived you of that? Like, because there, there are certain things they haven't gravitated towards that you would love to be buying stuff for about yes yes it has yeah it's, it's, it's torture i was expecting a more diplomatic answer there i love it i cry myself to sleep every night you know, i bought footballs and they're just laying there you know like it's just it's ridiculous it's, I, I remember seeing a bunch of footballs. You even bought pink footballs. That's how was that kind of your compromise or something? Or? That's right. Shaving kit. And it's just, no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it does. It's it's good. It is good in a sense that you don't project your ambitions onto them hmm. in, in the same way. You know what I mean? Like you don't live vicariously through pushing them hard at at, um, at playing. You know football or something like that. Not that I was ever driven at that, but you know what I mean? I can I can yeah. imagine I can see why parents get very deeply involved in that sort of stuff. And particularly if it's a particular sport that they loved and played when they were young. Mm. And then they see an ability or an opportunity that's just in front of their child that um that they were denied or didn't quite get to and they, I can I can see how you would vicariously pour lots of that in. And that's very, very dangerous and mm. very bad parenting on occasion. So mm. it does save, well, saves them. It doesn't save me. It <laughs> saves them from that kind of experience. <laughs> Do you get more pleasure buying stuff for them or for yourself? Uh, Be honest. Oh, well, probably. Genuinely, probably for them, because you get really excited about opening up new worlds for them. You know, yeah. hey, try this. They're very non consumeristic, though. Um, my daughters, which is, yeah. again, admirable, but, you know, I just want them to get into this. And <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, where, where'd they get that from? They're nothing like you. <laughs> you <laughs> buys everything and hoards, hoards stuff. And <laughs> Only very niche, good, like things you're supposed to have, yeah. like, you know, rare Nick Cave CDs and stuff. Yeah. But but <laughs> they're not shown any interest in Nick Cave whatsoever. No. And it's really, really quite frustrating. But, but maybe skateboarding is the thing. I mean, these are sort of pink and exciting. Look at this Vision Gator and the Psycho Stick here. I like, I like, that. I like that idea, Tim. I, I mean, I, I haven't got much to bring to the party, but I think I can imagine some of the people out there who've started buying stuff for their kids are going to have some great examples. I'd look forward to hearing them on Reddit and Twitter and stuff. I remember seeing it with my dad. So thinking the other way upwards, you know, when. Like um, I work in the garden or, or show ex- 
you know, interest in the gun. And then dad would be like, oh, yeah, he'd, he'd go on a real thing about, yeah, you know, teaching it. And I'd be like, ah, uh, not really. Like, I'm not no. interested, you know, like. <laughs> Your dad wanted to go out and buy you a nice pair of secateurs and a rake. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. And I had I was into drumming for a while, so Dad bought me a drum kit because Dad was a really good drummer. Mm. He was oh well, you know like in an old fashioned Salvation Army kind of snare drum kind of big band sort of way. Yeah. So you know I showed some interest. So he's like, oh let's get a drum kit, you know. And then I was like, I never really, you know, was that into it. It was just like you could see, oh that's the thing that he would like to invest in. Same with an organ. He went out and bought an organ, like. <laughs> Like I had zero interest in learning the organ. I'm I'm suddenly not feeling like I'm going to need this. Uh, Tim's family was so poor music anymore. Your, your dad's buying drum kits and organs and anything you show the mild interest in. He goes out and buys you somebody. Well, they're, they're, but they're not they're not sort of things that that are cool. You know what I mean? Like it's like yeah. Somehow we couldn't afford jeans, but we've got an organ. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> That's, I had to learn the organ for four years. It's like, oh man, what am I going to do? <laughs> the organ. And then when when um, he he passed away and we were downsizing the house and everything for mum to move. And look, you can't give these organs away, right? You call up places and they're like, yeah. nah, 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 no way. Yeah. But anyway, it, it was it took it took up a disproportionate amount of <laughs> room oh, yeah. for. Yeah. 35 years in the, in the lounge room. We, we bought an apartment, my wife and I, that ca- came with a piano and we never once played it, obviously. And then we sold the apartment years and years later and the piano had never been touched or moved and it was sold on with the apartment and it would just be there forever because oh, really? you just can't move the thing. <laughs> no, no, that's wrong. Maybe the coffee machine will be the thing. They've, they've certainly, they are quite interested in the coffee machine yeah. and they're, they're very good at making coffees. They're right across it. So maybe finally we've tapped something there. Coffee machine's almost as big as the organ, so it's very appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be your organ, that coffee machine. Would you like to hear an idea from one of our stakeholders? Oh, absolutely. Let me find one. All right, here we go. Hi, I'm Zachary from the very interesting land of Colorado in America. Right now, I'm finishing up high school, so I don't have a job, but I'm looking to work over the summer. There's not anything super interesting about me, other than the fact I have a twin named Daniel. He also listens to the podcast, and we both found the show on our own about the same time, and have been listening ever since. Here's a picture of me and Daniel when we were little. I'd prefer you didn't show this. We're quite a bit older now. I'm the one on the right. That's no help to anyone because obviously I'm not going to show the picture. <laughs> I'm. Can I just stop for a second, Tim? I'm fascinated by the idea that he has a twin that found the Unmade podcast independently. How do you mean? They both listen to the podcast, but they found the show on mm. their own. Like, it's not like one brother said to the other, oh, you should listen to this. They both just found oh. it and started listening to it. Well, folks, if you can just imagine Zachary and Daniel there standing together, just do that, but not as they are now, back when they were young. Okay, now we've got the mental picture. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> this is indicating to me that perhaps enjoyment of the Unmade podcast is genetic, like it's in your DNA. Oh, maybe we are one big family in that sense. That's maybe. It. Maybe maybe that needs to be in those like DNA tests. Like it needs to be one of the things they test for, enjoyment of the Unmade podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it could be like a thing. <laughs> Do you have a disproportionate passion for spoons? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Here's Zachary's idea for a podcast. It's called The Obscure Places Podcast. Not a very good name, but I'm sure Tim will have a better one. Wink. Basically, the hosts will talk about a different obscure place every week. No USA, no UK. Places English speakers don't even know a lot about, like Mongolia and Moldova and Djibouti. Each episode is a deep dive into the place. You could talk about the culture, the food, the language, the politics. You could get interviews with people or eventually listeners living in that country. It also wouldn't have to be countries. It could also be regions or cities. You could also have the audience vote on places they'd like to learn about. I think this would be a really fun podcast if it doesn't already exist. I'd love to hear what you guys think about it. Please feel free to be harsh. Thanks, Zachary. Well, that's rubbish. Totally rubbish. (laughs) Harsh enough for you, Zachary. (laughs) Do you know what's amazing? About 20 minutes after I got that email, I got another email from someone called Daniel who had the exact same idea. (laughs) Um, oh, that's very, very but, good. But honestly, yeah. 
But on a serious note, Zachary, uh, that's a good idea. It's like, I mean, that's basically a what idea. a lot of, yeah. you know, travel features are based on, isn't it? You know, showing you unusual exotic places. So what's the most obscure place you've been, Tim? Uh, well, I was, I was born and, and grew up in Terrelgan. I don't think it gets more obscure than that. <laughs> Now I live in Adelaide. So, <laughs> uh, overseas, I haven't been anywhere terribly obscure at all. I'm not. I've only my, my overseas travel has been to, you know, to pretty the primary colours, you know, to New York and to London and all that. I have to say, hang on a second. I did go to a place called Myrtle Beach when I was speaking in um, Atlanta. I went with a friend to, you know, go and speak with a bunch of young people who were doing. A, a course at um, Myrtle Beach, which affectionately seems to be called Dirty Myrtle because it's one of those sort of beachside towns with sort of, you know, Ferris wheels and old carny stuff that's just a bit tired and, yeah. you know, ice cream places. So that's probably, Myr- I don't know, Myrtle Beach, in I think it's in South Carolina, which is not very obscure, but it's not somewhere you would set out for yeah. from the other side of the world. That sounds mm. good. Sounds good. What about you? You've travelled all over. You've been everywhere. Yeah, I mean, because of work and other stuff, I guess there's probably quite a few places. I mean, it's not a particularly obscure place, but Bhutan is quite an unusual place to go because it's quite a sort of hard place to get into. That was that's an unusual place to have been to. Oh yeah. And they don't like you know they don't they don't have any traffic lights in the whole. They did have one set of traffic lights in the whole country, but the people decided they didn't like it, so they got rid of it. And now there's just a policeman that stands at that intersection. Nice. But, yeah. But. Uh, <laughs> Bhutan. There were a few times driving across um, Chile. There were a few places where there were just like weird graveyards on the side of the road that we went and had a look at That where you felt like you were in a really weird place. I don't know. There are probably a few. There are a few around the place. Depends where you're thinking from. So it's been like I've been to Vanuatu, which is just very close to Australia and beautiful place. Hmm. Um, beautiful people but if from the perspective of north america it's quite obscure you know you know how you say the people of vanuatu are like beautiful people Hmm. are there many countries where you say the country's wonderful but the people like suck uh like it it seems like only really france is the only country where you're allowed to say the people aren't good (laughs) every other country very nice yeah and britain i guess you sort of say british people are a bit whingy but other than britain and france you seem to have to say the people are lovely everywhere well, I guess it's the, you always encounter as a guest people who are being very hospitable. So that's the thing. That's the reason I say that. They were extremely hospitable. Hmm. Just, you know, it wasn't it's like walking around. It's like, hey, that guy's nice on the other yeah. side of the road. It's like, well, I haven't spoken to him. I don't know what his personality is. So basically you're saying the guy who carried your bags who was hoping for a $10 tip from you was very nice. <laughs> no, I mean the whole village right. cooked a special meal for us and went out of their way. It was unbelievable. Oh, but, right. um yeah, yeah. Were they big unmade podcast fans? Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Show us another spoon, Tim. <laughs> I was greeted like 3PO. I was like a god. It was like... <laughs> <laughs> greeted like 3PO. Yeah. No, it's... Um, the the Nivanawatu know that... Well, I mean, they, they just are, yeah, beautiful people. But I think... Like, Australians aren't always the nicest people, are we? I mean, we're always... I know, Australians are... F- Australians are, like, overly friendly. Yeah? Yeah. Australians are very, very happy to talk to strangers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In foot loudly and... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Using... You're like that. You, you, you talk to everyone. And, and I know it's like your job is part of being nice and helping people as well, but, like, I think that's it for today. Oh, no, no. No. Anyway, no, sorry, keep going. No yes. secret words, Tim. You've missed your chance. I have. Go on then. Oh. Say them now. Have you um, have you been to Thailand? I have been to Thailand. Yes. Nice. Yeah. I haven't. Right. I've been. I've been to Laos. Laos reasonably obscure, I guess. Oh, yeah, that is obscure. Um, yeah. 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 I've been. You know, to, that's a beautiful part of the world. Yeah. Beautiful people. Were your secret words countries? No, not at all. Oh, no. are you not talking well, about your secret words yet? You're just t- asking me about countries now. No. <laughs> oh, one of them was Thai. But I don't know if it was Thai, as in tie my shoes, or Thai uh, the people. Oh, okay. So, Thai. I have another one here, and I don't know how I'm going to fit it in. Just say it. Marshmallow. Just a reminder, if you go to patreon.com slash unmadefm, you can become a stakeholder, which means you could win spoons and cards and have your ideas read out on the podcast. And also, we do other bonus stuff and try to make you feel special for going the extra mile. But even if you aren't a stakeholder, if you can review or rate the podcast, which is something we rarely ask people to do, but if you do that, apparently 
that's good for us. Like apparently, I don't know. If, apparently, it's like helps get more listeners, and getting more listeners is good for us because it means we can make more episodes. Are there, there should be. Are there awards for you know? We know when we're doing a podcast. Are there like the Golden Globes or the Oscars or something? Yeah, but we'd we'd never win those because they're they're voted. They're usually like public votes, so you need a bigger bigger audience. Oh. I'm not saying we'd win them if they were on merit. I'm just saying I'm just saying we won't win them the way they are now either. <laughs> so we're sort of, you know, we're we're more likely to, you know, win the golden bear. You know what I mean? Like it's it's obscure um, art house sort of. Podcast I like I like world. to think we're just winning hearts one by one. <laughs> one by one being the the operative part of that sentence. <laughs> being the operative word, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. So anyway, thank you for thank you for listening this far into the podcast. You've done well. You've pretty much made it to the end of this episode. They have made it to the end of this episode. They literally have. There is no more. This is the end of this episode. Officially. There are no more words after this one. <laughs>